Hello everybody, welcome back along to Five Sisters Zoo. My name's Adam, I'm delighted that you have chosen to join us again this week. Over the past couple of weeks I've really enjoyed telling you guys a little bit about animal adaptations, about their habitats, and we focused quite a bit on one specific habitat last week, the rainforest. This week's slightly different. I'm going to introduce you to three words now, three words I'm sure many of you will have heard before. Herbivore, carnivore and omnivore. Now these three words have a lot to do with what a species will eat. Herbivores tend to tend to eat plants and fruits, carnivores will eat lots of meat, omnivores eat a little bit of both. So that's the simplest way of putting that and what we're going to do today guys is we are going to be having a look at an example of a herbivore, an example of a carnivore and an example of an omnivore that lives right here at Five Sisters Zoo. We're going to have a little chat about what exactly they like to eat and how they have adapted to, to eat those specific foods. And on Thursday's lesson we're going to focus a little bit more on food chains and food webs and we're going to show you some examples of some food chains and webs that exist right here in Scotland. So we're starting off today by having a little look at a species that certainly doesn't come from Scotland. We are going to look at our wallabies and we're going to have a little bit of a chat about what our wallabies like to eat and how their teeth and their skull has adapted to allow them to eat that food. So I've put my mask back on because we are in our wallaby walkthrough enclosure now and we have some food here for the red-necked wallabies and the parma wallabies that call, call this habitat here at Five Sisters Zoo home. And you can see that in our feed bucket here we have lots of leafy greens and we also, down at the bottom here, have lots of root vegetables as well. So we've got things like carrots and we've got parsnip in here too. Um, now wallabies are a prime example of her a herbivore. So these guys are herbivorous. They like to eat lots of plant material. They're going to eat grasses and leaves normally. Obviously here at the zoo we feed them lots of those root vegetables as well. And here at Five Sisters Zoo we have two different species of wallaby. We have our red-necked wallabies. I'm joined by two red-necked wallabies just over here to my side. And we also have some parma wallabies living in this enclosure as well. Now wallabies belong to a big group of animals known as the marsupials which means they have a little kind of pouch on their bellies. That's where the youngsters um, will, uh, will go after they're born and that's where they're reared. So they spend their first um, several months in those pouches growing up, growing strong before they kind of emerge out into the, out into the open world. And uh, so these guys belong to that marsupial group, but they are also herbivores. So I have a smaller replica wallaby skull here. Now this one isn't real. Um, but this gives you a good idea of how their, their teeth are specially adapted to allow them to eat all these greens. So if I just lift that up there, hopefully you guys can see this. Now I'm sure a lot of you at home will know what the, the teeth in your own mouth are called. So you've got your incisors, you've got your canines, and you've got your molars, those flat ones right at the back of your mouth that are used for grinding up um, all of that food that you eat. Now these guys here, wallabies, they've got special incisors, specialised kind of long incisors at the front of their mouths um, which are really good for cutting grass um, and leaves as well for cutting them up too and then at the backs of their mouth they've got these very kind of flattened specialised molars that they'll use for grinding up all of their food. So these guys here are very specialised and they are going to eat lots of vegetation. They're not going to be seen eating meats or anything like that. It is lots of grasses, lots of leaves. These guys are a perfect example of what a herbivore looks like. And they come from over in Eastern and Southern Australia. So you can see they're enjoying some of those greens there just now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just scatter some more of these greens around just now for them to enjoy munching on. We might be joined by some of our parma wallabies in a minute too as well. So 
So guys, what we're gonna do next is we are gonna head up and have a little look at an example of a carnivore next. So we've come from our wallaby enclosure where we were looking at a herbivore species across to our arctic wolf enclosure to have a little look at a carnivore species now. So we have Aria and Luna, our two female arctic wolves in the enclosure behind me. I'm not sure if you guys can see them just now but we are going to leave you with a little bit of footage after I've had a chat down here. Now Aria and Luna, as I've mentioned, they are arctic wolves. The arctic wolf is just a subspecies of grey wolf though and grey wolves are one of the widest spread mammal species on earth. We find them across Asia, across North America, across much of Europe too and believe it or not at one point in time we would even have found grey wolves living right here in the UK. So I'm going to be very very quiet now because one of the two girls has actually just come right down to the fence. This is Aria behind me here just now. She's got these really amber eyes. Luna's eyes are a much kind of darker, mistier colour. Luna's just up behind some of the trees in the distance there just now. So I've, as I've mentioned, these guys are carnivores. They like to eat meat. And I have another replica skull with me now. This time it's a replica wolf skull. And you can see it looks really quite different to the wallaby skull we had a look at a few minutes ago. So just looking at the teeth there, those teeth are much, much sharper. Um, they're much more like blades, which is very useful when these animals are slicing through or piercing meat that they are going to be eating. So these guys will hunt in packs normally. They're going to be hunting things like deer. Occasionally they might um, eat some birds. Some Well, they'll also eat carrion sometimes as well, which are dead animals that are left behind um, from when other larger animals have killed. Um, and these teeth are really useful for when they're eating all of those prey items. You can see they've got these huge big canines. So we have canines. These guys have much bigger ones that they'll use for piercing um, and stabbing. They've got these incisors at the front that they'll use for slicing. Now these guys also have very specialized teeth called carnassials towards the back of their mouth. That's something that we don't have. It's certainly something that animals like the wallabies, those herbivores, carnassials are not, um, are not something that they'll ever have. And um, these teeth are really sharp. They're like blade edges and they're gonna be used um, for slicing just um, a bit like the incisors at the front, but they're much larger, yeah? Now, if we look at the skull here as well, you can see this ridge on top. This bit here is something called the sagittal crest. And now what I want you guys at home to do is if you take your fingers and put them on your temples like that and then clench your jaw, do that. You can feel your jaw muscles tensing. Our jaw muscles attach up to our temples. Wolves like Aria and Luna, the two behind me there, their jaw muscles attach much further back. Um, they attach to the sagittal crest instead and that allows their jaws to be incredibly powerful and that's what gives them the power to slice through all that meat and crunch through bone as well because these guys are capable of chewing through bone sometimes too and it is really really important when we're feeding the carnivores here at Five Sisters Zoo that we feed them as well as much meat on the bone as possible so these guys are given full um, full chickens we don't cut it up for them so they're given things like full chicken full rabbits um, and it's really important that these guys have to work their way through all the fur all the hair and chew through that bone as well it actually keeps their teeth nice and healthy it keeps our digestive system nice and healthy too. I'm sure you guys at home, I hope anyway, I hope you brush your teeth to keep them nice and clean and nice and healthy. We can't send somebody into the wolf enclosure to brush their teeth and out in their native habitat, um, they're certainly not gonna be doing anything like that either. So instead, they chew through that bone which helps keep their teeth nice and strong and nice and healthy too. That is really, really a big important part of their diet. I think they've disappeared now, but there's one of them just running back our way here just now. Fantastic. They look absolutely incredible, especially in the snow because they've got that lovely white coat, um, which helps them to blend in in these kind of cold tundra environments where we find them. I think they've disappeared for now. So we are gonna head up to have a pay a little visit to an omnivore now.
So for those of you that tuned into our Habitats and Adaptations classes a couple of weeks ago, this setting might be slightly familiar to you. We are, of course, in front of our European brown bear enclosure. And right now, here at Five Sisters, we have one European brown bear called Esso. And she is currently going through something called torpor. So in the winter months, brown bears living in the colder parts of the northern hemisphere, they go into a very deep sleep known as torpor. It's slightly different to true hibernation that uh, hedgehogs and things like that will go through. Um, they do go into that deep sleep though and they, they aren't out and about anywhere near as often as they normally are. So right now Esso is asleep somewhere in the middle of the enclosure. We haven't seen very much of her over the past few weeks and that's exactly how we want it to be at this time of year. Now We've not come up here today just to talk about her torpor though. We've come here because brown bears are a perfect example of an omnivore. So these guys are omnivorous. So they will eat lots of plant material, lots of fruits, um, but they also eat some meat as well. So some protein, they'll eat fish. They'll chase small, small animals, small mammals like rabbits. They'll occasionally chase things like deer sometimes as well. So these guys here are capable hunters, but they're also very good at foraging as well. And I've brought along an example of just some of the foods that the brown bears here at Five Sisters Zoo over the years, the brown bears that we have kept, um, the kind of foods that they might be fed. So they are going to eat a lot more fruit and veg than you might expect them to. So we feed them things like lettuces, um, they get different things like cucumbers, they'll get lots of fruits. So we've got some pomegranate in here just now. Um, we've also um, got some melon there too and there's also things like peppers and um, I'll show you the bucket and you can see that in there so it's quite colourful there's um, lots of greens in there and um, lots of fruits and veg and so about 80 to 90 percent of, um, of a bear's diet can sometimes comprise of um, fruits and vegetables but they are also going to eat some meat some protein and um, so we've also got some fish in this bucket um, today as well so we will feed the bears here at five sisters we'll feed them things like fish we'll feed them rabbit chicken things like that too um, so these guys are perfect examples of omnivores and their diet is fairly similar um, to the diet that a lot of humans will have as well so a lot of humans um, will eat both meat and lots of greens as well hopefully and that's how we stay nice and nice and healthy by making sure that we're eating lots of fruit and vegetables um, along with um, various different kinds of proteins so a lot of humans will eat meat and veggies um, just like the bears um, that we keep here at Five Sisters and the bears that live out there in their native habitats. So I've got a bear skull along with me now again this is just a replica so it's not a real one and you can see just by looking at this skull these guys they've got these big kind of canines at the front of their mouths that they'll use for kind of stabbing their food uh, into food and um, kind of tearing they've got these incisors for cutting um, but at the backs of their mouths unlike the the wolf the carnivore that we had a little chat about a few minutes ago remember they've got those really sharp um, teeth at the backs of their mouths that they use for slicing like the wallabies and like ourselves bears have these very flat molars at the backs of their mouths that they'll use for grinding up all of that vegetation that they are going to eat. So these guys truly are omnivores and in fact the vast majority of a brown bear's diet is made up of fruits and vegetables not meat and that's quite surprising because people do associate big animals like brown bears um, with you know lots of meat eating and lots of chasing prey around and things like that these guys will do that but not nearly as much as you might think there is one carnivorous species of bear out there the polar bear and um, they are carnivores and um, so they're a bit different but brown bears like the ones that we have here certainly like to eat lots and lots of vegetation so We've introduced to you now an example of a herbivore, an example of a carnivore, and an example of an omnivore, all of which live here at Five Sisters. We've spoken a little bit about how their teeth differ, and a little bit about skull structure as well. Remember that sagittal crest on the wolf skull? So have a little think about your own teeth. You guys obviously have canines, incisors and molars that are really important for, those canines are important for kind of stabbing and tearing, those incisors for cutting and those molars for grinding. And remember, we just mentioned the bears have all of them too. Have a little think about those teeth in your mouths and a little bit about your diet as well. And the next time that you're eating, think about what teeth um, are important when 
Obviously, teeth are very important for kind of chewing food up and it helps with digestion. Um, but have a little have a little think in your next meal and think a little bit more about the, the purpose of each different kind of tooth in your own mouth. It's fascinating when you start thinking about things like that. Now, what we're going to do is to finish up today, we're going to head down to well, another carnivore species, a very special um, kind of carnivore that we have living here at Five Sisters. We're just going to briefly chat to you a little bit about the work that we do with this next species. And next time, we're going to be chatting on Thursday a little bit about how important this next animal is within a, a, well, a food web or a food chain that we find right here in Scotland. So we're finishing up today's lesson with Morag, Fletcher, Harris, Aaron and Jura behind me. They are of course our five Scottish wildcats that call Five Sisters Zoo home right now. Now these five individuals, they're all carnivores. The Scottish wildcat is a carnivore and well, it's, a, it's native. It's found right here in this country. That's what makes them just so, so exciting. Now, unfortunately, they haven't been doing too well over recent decades, and that's why there's now a big sort of breeding effort to try and um, help boost their population numbers. And we're really excited because the individuals living in this enclosure here are part of those efforts. And we're going to be starting off right here at our Scottish Wildcat enclosure on Thursday's lesson where we're going to be joined by Gary, our head carnivore keeper, and we're going to be asking him a few questions about the wildcats, about what they like to eat and why they are so important, well, an important part of a, of a food chain and a food web. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit more about those food chains and food webs, what they are, some examples when you join us again on Thursday. So. Thank you so much for tuning in again today and I look forward to seeing everybody later in the week. Thank you.